Greetings for our Ukrainian friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. Happy Easter. And uh, just really grateful to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me <coughs> into your places and your spaces. And um, just kind of thinking about the time, how, asking a question, where has the time gone, really? I was thinking about that this past week. Because now we are, we're past Easter, and, and we know here, and where we live here, or where I live here in central Alberta, you know, the spring is in the air, the days are longer, warmer, the Canada geese are, are filling the skies. And before um, we know it, around our parts is the sound of the robins and other birds will be heard from the treetops. I know the farmers in our area are <clears throat> itching to prep their land for seeding. The grade 12 uh, graduation class preparing to say goodbye to their halls and byways of their school that they've gone to in a few short months. Onward to new adventures and definitely we can say some challenges before them. Indeed folks, spring is in the air. And somewhere in the gathering, possibly near you or me, uh, what some call or what some might call a church gathering, a prayer is lifted up skyward. And the prayer goes something like this. O God of pronouns, the one who is identifiable as God, the I am who I am, the God of they, incarnate she, he, God of trans being, you shatter all stereotypes, making male and female intersecting binary. Spectrum, rainbow God, God of pronouns, who says you can call me he, she, or they, whatever makes you feel closest to me. You are the God of pronouns. Maybe there's some eyeballs that are getting a little wider. Some of the ears are going, what did the pastor just say? But for now, before we address this, let's go into our Bibles. And please turn with me or turn on your Bible app or whatever you're using to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we'll be reading through verse 1 to 5. First, Chim First Chimney, no, First Timothy, pardon me, chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. Verse 1. The Spirit clearly says, says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order, them to and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, the truth of God, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to understand this word that you have for us today. Not only understand it, but to uh, put it deep into our hearts and lead us, Holy Spirit, and all that we do to glorify God today in this message and then in our actions to follow it. Whether it be something that we need to do before you, Lord, or we need to do for you in our culture in the sense of bringing glory to your name, Lord. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, after a number of weeks, we pick up on the sermon series that we paused during our Easter preparation, uh, the series called What is the Church? Which has been a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the Apostle Paul's first letter to his friend and fellow co-worker, Timothy. We know that Timothy, at the time of the writing of this letter, was pastoring the church in Ephesus, a church that had some serious issues to, to really kind of downplay it, but they were really serious to deal, with, uh, to deal with. And primarily it was because of the impact of false teachers and their teaching in the body of Christ. I would encourage you as well uh, to read and study the other two letters written by Paul, 2 Timothy and Titus, because these three, 1, 2, uh, Timothy and Titus, make up 
what is called the pastoral letters. And they're really good to understand as a whole. Last week on Resurrection Sunday, for those of you who are listening to this online and might remember, for those that you didn't, we, we examined in part the first First letter to Cor- uh, Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the verse 19 verses, where Paul there was refuting those in the church uh, that were teaching and denying the resurrection of the dead to come. And in one sentence in that particular section of the, of, of the Bible, uh, the letter, Paul presented the core and essential gospel of Jesus Christ, which we can paraphrase in this way. Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried. Christ was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And as we discussed last week, we came to a conclusion that so-called Christian movements that we find in our culture today have moved further and further from the authority and teaching of the Bible concerning doctrines like this of the resurrection to come. Just to mention one very important and central, essential teaching of biblical Christianity. And if we think through this logically, if we go to its, uh, down that road to its conclusion, where you and I can deconstruct the Bible by engaging current cultural norms, trends, definitions of religion, family, human philosophies, other religions, and the very popular spiritism of our time, we will eventually create the very God of our own imagination and selfish, sinful desires. The prayer which I read at the introduction, which was a prayer to some sort of God, was uh, I found uh, in, uh, from a church belonging to the PC USA, the Presbyterian Church USA. So let me ask you this question then. Are you surprised that some who call themselves Christians would pray to a God who is revealed as he, she, or they? Uh, I suspect not many of us that are true believers would be surprised these days. But what if I said that there are those who would never pray such a prayer, yet have in many ways detached themselves from the authority and the teaching from the Bible, from the commands of God? I think that one there is a little harder to answer definitively. It was back early November 2021, where I and my wife attended the district prayer retreat put on by a denomination at Lake Louise. If you've never heard of Lake Louise, Google it, you're going to see. It's amazing. I grew up in the mountains nearby there, and when I went there this past November, or November 2021, it was so good to be able to gather together with other pastors and leaders in in such a really, for me, a life-giving location after really a crazy time during 2021, which we were all experiencing. One time I was grabbing one of my favorite drinks that I like to drink when, when I'm there, it's the Americano, when I noticed the person wearing a rainbow mask. Now, I think you know what I'm talking about. Now, there's nothing unusual in our time for people to be wearing that symbol. To me, I noticed that this person that was wearing this mask was wearing a lanyard like I was wearing and indicating they belonged to a certain alliance church and were involved in some way or in part, of, in part of the leadership of that church. Now, I can't say, I'm not trying to judge that, I'm just saying I can't say why that person was supporting the LGBTQ community by wearing a symbol of their political and cultural movement. In part, what I can say, that maybe, not sure on this, but sure seems this way, that this person may no longer consider Genesis and God's design an order concerning men and women as authoritative, as authoritative for today, and may in part be convinced that God's love supersedes his holy and just character, who is willing to ignore his design and order, his commands for the sake of love. Now, that was my observation and thoughts through that, so we'll just leave that for now. Paul said to Timothy, and we just read that together, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So what we've just done now is we've time warped now back from the 21st century back into the 1st century Ephesus. 
As I was mentioned at the beginning, as was mentioned at the beginning, I mean, pardon me, the dysfunction in the Ephesian church stemmed from false teaching. In other words, unbiblical teaching. But there's one other thing we just want to deal with very quickly here, and that's this phrase in verse 1 called later times. We just need to ask this question, what does this mean? Was Paul talking about these, um, those that, who abandoned their faith and follow deceiving spirits as, as things taught by demons in the first century? Yes. Was Paul talking about the 21st century? Yes. Was Paul talking about the Middle Ages? Yes. Was Paul talking about present, uh, past, present, future? Yes. But let's listen to what Jesus, our Lord, had to say about false prophets and teachers. And he also talked about true prophets. But I'll, well, I'm just going to camp on the negative part of this thing that Jesus said. This, was found, this is found in the Sermon on the Mount, which we have in our Gospels, in the Gospels, a wonderful sermon of Jesus. And he spoke about these true and false prophets. And he said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 7. And then Jesus went on, in the, in just shortly after this, to speak about true and false disciples. And speaking of false disciples, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus also reminds us in the Gospels that we would be wise to build our house on the rock that is Christ alone. For Jesus said, therefore, everyone who hears these words, and this is at the end of his Sermon on the Mount, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. See, friends, when the waters rise and the winds howl, our house will stand if it is built, pardon me, if it's built on Jesus and his commands. And here's the point regarding later times. Because later times began when Jesus was born in a manger and will continue until he returns. And until then, Jesus is telling us it would be wise to follow him and only him because the waters and the winds of false prophets, empty human philosophies, ever-changing cultural norms and pressures will continue to bash at the foundation of Jesus Christ. And Paul even tells us that some will abandon the faith through all of this. Now, why would Paul say some would abandon the faith? Well, in part, to answer that question, we can look at verse 2. So, let's look at verse 2 together. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. You see, these who abandon the faith, or as the meaning of the original word describes, have fallen away, have apostatized, do so because they've listened to the teachings of hypocritical liars who have had their consciences silenced because of their sin. Therefore, they are, whether they're teachers or believers or those that follow these false teachers, they're incapable of knowing or speaking the truth about God. Incapable, spiritually incapable. A number of years ago, quite a few years ago, Hillsong, Australia, under the leadership of Brian Houston, in the last recent decade or so, exploded and became a movement that certainly has influenced Christian music. Um, Hillsong United, I think that's their brand name. And it's certainly this movement here from Hillsong, Australia, has impacted many other areas of the evangelical church. And it was under Houston's direction that he appointed a fellow by the name of Carl Lentz to be lead pastor of Hillsong, New York. And it was uh, late 2020 that Carl Lentz was removed from that position by Houston because it was found that he had been in an adulterous relationships 
relationship, among other disturbing sins. But during his tenure there, Lenz became known as the pastor to the celebrities. And soon he was drawing up to 6,000 uh, people a week to his services in New York, Hillsong, New York. And if when we uncover this, uh, when you uncover this, you'll see that really what they were doing, even if they were genuinely interesting in following the Lord, they became many ways similar to Carl Lentz himself, seeking fame and fortune. Carl Lentz was the you know, spiritual director for Justin Bieber's. And soon after that relationship started to grow, Hillsong, New York was attracting many other celebrities such as Selena Gomez and Kelvin Durant to make just to name a few. He also began to make the rounds to the TV shows like Oprah Winfrey and all the other ones in New York. So what happened to Carl Lentz? Well, in a way, friends, Carl Lentz was the making of his own disaster. He followed the ways of the world instead of the ways of Jesus Christ. And for sure, based on that action, those behaviors, he is accountable to God for his actions, including the people that he led astray. And I pray that he genuinely repents. But yet, Carl Lentz was also a product of what Brian Houston has been selling with Hillsong for a very long time. We see these Christian words being used in their messages. They're quoting scriptures, they're teaching truth, but then they throw in a dash of empty human and cultural philosophy. And the bottom line of this is Houston teaches and preaches really what's called a prosperity gospel. Health, wealth, and success. All the things that the world naturally craves and pursues. And Brian Houston himself is a product of what he learned from preachers and teachers when he came and went around in North America in the earlier years to teach the very same thing with their own success. Now, most likely, Hillsong started on the right path. I don't know. But in reality, what it has become is a huge business. It isn't essentially a corporation. It is recorded as LLC. And they sell their religious products all over the world. Folks, when you think about this, this is, a, this is building a house, as we would say today, on a deck of cards. And sooner or later, that house is going to fall down. So a bit of a news flash. This is recent news. Um, it, Brian Houston has recently resigned from his leadership role. Why? Because whatever he was doing was not working anymore. And these uh, things were coming to the surface. He's resigned. He was removed from leadership role. And then I believe if Paul were here today, I believe strongly that he would compare, not that I'm here comparing uh, Paul with them or anything like that, but he would say that Houston and Lenz and people like that would be no different than the people he references in this letter called, one, two of them in particular, Hymenius and Alexander, who Paul said suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. They destroyed their faith by following and believing something else other than Jesus' gospel. But let's be real, because not only have uh, Houston and Lenz abandoned their faith, the trail is littered with many over the total history of the church that have done the same thing. Just like the ones that left Jesus when he challenged them to leave it all behind and follow him, and they made up excuses. No, I gotta go bury my dad, or I'll, I'll, I gotta go plant a crop, or whatever. And here's the hard part of it. Uh, it's hard pill to swallow for many. Because this is biblical. Jesus will have all of you, I have all of me, or none of you, or none of me. But there's another layer that we find here in these first five verses that's really important for us to really grasp, is the spiritual realm, the spiritual warfare that we see here. 
Because behind all false teachers, all false teaching, idolatry, religions, many of the cultural values that are being promoted, the progressive church, however you want to see it, understand that, and even any false notions about God that can occur in our very own lives, this is the doctrine of demons. And, and Paul puts it this way, things taught by demons, same thing. And as we look a little closer at this for the next few minutes, we should not think Paul is looking for devils in every nook and cranny, nor should we do that likewise. See, Satan, friends, doesn't work that way. Satan is a master of deception. He's a trickster. He's a trickster. But someone once said, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. Let me repeat that again. It is easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. We see this where Paul describes deceiving spirits here in verse 1. That those who abandon their faith, they follow these deceiving spirits. Friends, this is the operating system, if you will, of all demons. And the clear teaching of the Old Testament and New Testament reveals the corrupt nature of Satan and his fallen angels, who are always seducing and leading people astray, and especially away from God. As one commentator put it, demons are spiritual agents acting in all idolatry. The idol is nothing, but every idol has a demon associated with it, who induces idolatry which, with its worship and sacrifice. Carl Lentz, my friends, sold his soul to the idolatry, idolatry of fame. Instead of worshiping God who created him, he worshiped and sacrificed to the God of fame, popularity, sex, and money. And behind all this was a deceiving spirit, a demon, corrupting Lentz, Deceiving lens in the name of Christianity. And Paul would call people like Lens who preach a false gospel and those who believe a false gospel hypocritical liars because their consciences have been seared because of the sin they're steeped in. And friends, a seared conscience is un unable, unable, will not be able to do this judge between truth and error, thus incapable of any godly behavior. But a good conscience, a healthy conscience, that is led by faith in Christ empowers you and me to navigate the moral, uh, the moral dilemmas, pardon me, of our time. It helps us navigate through that in these days. So moving now into verses 3 to 5, we find here those in the Ephesian church as described in verse 1 and 2. In that context, in the first century, were teaching certain false things. Paul said, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. Now, right from the start, we need to acknowledge this, that rules are good. Because rules do help us to maintain a balance in life and in society. But friends, when rules become a requirement to appease God, to earn salvation from him, rules then become killers. Remember, at the beginning of this message, we began with the plain and really uncomplicated gospel of Jesus. Jesus died, was buried, he rose again in three days, according to the Bible. And this is what God calls us to faith in, this simple gospel. Yet how quickly, how quickly we can abuse and misuse this wonderful, simple gospel message. And I found that primarily, you know, studying through some of this, that abuse of this simple gospel manifests itself in two ways in our lives and in the church. Legalism or permissivism. Legalism or permissive is permissiveness, not ism, permissive, 
permissiveness. Pardon me for the marbles. Here in Ephesus, first century, legalists were forbidding marriage and certain foods. So now let's fast forward to the 21st century. In my research, I discovered that Hillsong requires all its franchises, and that's what I'm calling these things, franchises, to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I hope you know what that means. And agree to adhere to the policies that Brian Houston and his leadership team have implemented. My friends, when a church requires its leaders and its members to give ultimate control and authority to a select few, this is legalism. And friends, there are so many ways legalism shows up in a church. But the bottom line is this. Legalism paints a picture of God that is inaccurate. It denies that God is the God of grace and mercy. It diminishes the work of Christ on the, Christ, on the cross. Christ on the cross. Because if I can do one, two, three, and four perfectly, why would I need the cross to forgive my sins? And we can't fulfill those things perfectly ever. And what happens with people caught up in this system of spiritual deception, many abandon the faith. And if they don't abandon the faith, they become filled with uncertainties and torment. The spiritual abuse makes them vulnerable to further deception and false teaching. This reminded me of a book called The Screwtape Letters, written by uh, C.S. Lewis, a work of fiction. And in it, you read about the senior devil teaching the junior devil this, quote, all extremes except extreme devotion to the enemy are to be encouraged. Now, the enemy, obviously, if you're a devil, is God. I'll read it again. All extremes except extreme devotion to the enemy are to be encouraged. Friends, legalism or permissiveness promotes any extreme possible other than obedience and faith in God. And those who teach these things are simply puppets being played by the demons behind these errors and lies. Because Paul tells us here in this scripture, for everything God created is good and nothing to be rejected. For God said this, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. We find that in the very first chapter of Genesis. We go to see another story in the Gospels as we bring this to a close. When Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees because they saw some of his disciples eating food with unwashed hands, they didn't challenge him because of the hygiene, but they challenged him because that was considered defilement. That was considered defilement. But Jesus knew that something was up because he didn't waste any time by pointing out these teachers of the law, these leaders in Jerusalem at the temple, their own hypocrisy. And he said to them this, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Say they're set aside. What, what commands of God did they set aside? Well, Jesus says, Moses said to honor your father and mother. Then he said to the Pharisees, but you declare that what might have been used to help their father or mother, that is the people coming to worship, Corban, that means devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. What these Pharisees were teaching, if you, if you had some sort of items or things that you could help your mother and father and they needed it, and you said, no, Corban, devoted to God, then you could give it to the Pharisees. You see, they were no different than Carl Lenz. They wanted the power, and they wanted the riches. Later, he got his disciples together, and he said, Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For if it doesn't go into their heart, for it doesn't go into their heart, pardon me, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. What comes out of a person's heart, Jesus is saying. See, friends, there's nothing wrong with singleness 
or abstaining from certain foods. Nowhere in the Bible is marriage forbidden either. And there's nothing wrong from staying away from certain foods. When you go for blood work to the doctor, they ask you to fast for 12 hours. You can still drink, they just say don't eat any food at all. So what is wrong here? Well, friends, when you or I create a God of our own imagination, which is this is what's happening in that PC USA. When you and I create a God of our own imagination, then spread that to others, we are thereby participating as agents of demons. And I just want to leave you with three things that will help you and remind you who you serve. One, love God with all who you are. Mind, body, everything. And love your neighbors as God loves them. And the third thing, know your Bible inside and out. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that the Bible paints the accurate and wonderful picture of who you are. As we just come through Easter, we are reminded that you so loved the world that you sent your one and only Son, that who would ever believe in him would have eternal life. Lord, thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.